everybody on YouTube, Facebook, or Zoom. And I'm happy that we have so many people attending. And I hand over tonight the moderation to Tel Aviv, to Inbal Ben Asher Gitner. And I am really very much looking forward to our discussion tonight. And please, Inbal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrea. Good evening, everyone. I'm also really happy to see so many participants. I would like to first wish everybody very happy December holidays. I'm talking to you from uh, Be'er Sheva, a little further south than Tel Aviv, okay. and we um, probably a lot of us uh, lit the first candle of Hanukkah here in uh, Israel tonight. So again, I uh, wish also our all our German uh, friends and collaborators happy uh, happy holidays in a couple of um, of weeks. Um, the the event is organized by uh, Ecomos uh, Germany and Ecomos Israel, and um, Eran Mordechovic uh, is here uh, tonight, uh, the head of Ecomos Israel, and also um, by uh, Docomomo Germany and Docomomo. Uh, Israel. I would also like um, to, to welcome my friends from Ecomos in Germany and uh, also uh, Jörg Haspel, the head of uh, Ecomos uh, in Germany. So welcome everyone, welcome our panelists, and without further ado, since we also want to have questions from the audience and everything, I would like to present our theme today and um, our, um, our first uh, speaker. Our, our series, Context, Contrast and Continuity, will concentrate today on uh, modernist uh, market houses, and we have um, two specialists that will talk about it. Um, Andrea Jürge from uh, Frankfurt and uh, Amir Freundlich from uh, Israel. We will uh, begin, I think, with you, um, Amir. Amir will, um, will present the very, very interesting market hall that was built in Haifa called the Talpiote Market. And a short introduction to introduce Amir. Amir was raised in Haifa and lived there for almost 30 years. He is uh, a graduate architecture from the Technion Israel Institute of uh, Technology and also um, studied conservation at Haifa University. He has been um, working as a conservation architect for over 20 years. And as he testifies, he has um, done, a, I can tell you, a wonderful job of uh, um, of documenting the Haifa Talpiot market, in, which is in the Hadar neighborhood. It's a very interesting neighborhood. We will talk about it later. Um, documented it and uh, learned a lot of uh, things and also about uh, many of the problems we have with the uh, uh, future, hopefully, conservation of this place. So, Amir, please, the screen and the stage is yours. Thank you very much for, for being with us here tonight. Well, uh, unfortunately, beside my last name, uh, I don't know word in uh, German, so uh, we'll do it. Uh, we'll do it in English. Um, as uh, Inbal mentioned, uh, I am very. I will uh, present to you some some thoughts and conclusions from the documentation report uh, I made last. What about last year for on the, the behalf of uh, the municipality of Haifa? Um, and I wish to start. A little bit uh, before the construction of the building in the early early 30s, and uh, these two photographs taken in Haifa in the old uh, Arab market uh, open market in downtown Haifa. Um, just a couple of years later, four years later, actually, the the Great Arab Revolt uh, uh, erupted. Uh, and thus, uh, and thus prevented uh, from uh, from Jewish uh, from Jews from from Adar Carmel from Haifa from the Jewish neighborhood to attend the to attend the market. And uh, this actually generated the need the need for a permanent uh, built market uh, that will guarantee the safety of the of the customers. And by doing so, uh, 
Maybe the first contrast, if we're talking about contrasts, is the cultural contrast of the concept of a marketplace. Uh, moving from a concept of an open market and a local market, authentic market, to a built, well-organized organized, uh, market, uh, very well designed, as seen on, uh, on the right. This was uh, the building that, uh, as it looked when it was uh, completed, uh, one of the finest uh, modernistic monuments in Haifa for sure, but maybe in Israel as well, uh, designed by Moshe Gerstel, an architect uh, well known in Israel, uh, that was working quite a lot uh, during uh, this, uh, this time in, in Palestine. Uh, you can see the contrast uh, as well in the, in the architectural design between this uh, fine uh, and pure uh, modernistic uh, design uh, against uh, the, 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 its surrounding and the, its uh, traditional buildings uh, surrounding it. A, a complete, uh, actually a complete, uh, complete stranger. And that's uh, the, the way it looks today from a similar point, uh, from pink, a similar view. Uh, quite tragically, uh, while the, when the, the building was completed, uh, the revolt was re resolved as well and peace uh, came back to Haifa. Uh, so the, the need of a safe, of a, of a safety, of a safe market, a closed and safe market, uh, was no longer needed. Maybe a little bit uh, about the place it was. It was erected. Uh, on the right, you can see the lot of the the, the lot uh, the marketplace is uh, future to be built. Uh, on the left, a map uh, from the 40s of of the. Uh, of Haifa during the, the mandate rule. Uh, during that time, Haifa was uh, developed uh, enormously, mainly thanks to the uh, new infra infrastructures uh, the British uh, rule uh, brought among uh, the railway system and may, mainly the harbor. Um, now the, the, the lot itself is here, uh, this triangle. Uh, just between the, the Arab quarters, downtown Haifa, and uh, as Inbal mentioned, Hadar Karmel, which was the main Jewish neighborhood uh, just above. You can see very nice on the, the picture on the right, uh, it's, that it was actually built on the end of the neighborhood. Um, we were very lucky to, to, to find a very nice documentation of the process of the building done by a professional photographer, enabling us to see the progress, uh, the progress uh, of the building from uh, March 1939. Till its completion, only later on, 13 months in April 1940. Um, another thing that uh, made us very lucky uh, is actually is the son of, of uh, Moshe Gerstel. His son is architect and architect as well, and the professor in the academy, in the Academy of the Technion, and uh, wrote, wrote quite a lot uh, preferences to his uh, father's uh, work and mainly, mainly to the Talpiot market. Uh, this is what he writes about the, the, the main facade of the building. The gentle proportion between the central block with the high windows, and this one which points the entrance to the, to the building, and the sides of the building with its horizontal windows that uh, goes all around it. Sadly, this is uh, its condition. Uh, its condition today. Um, quite tragically, <laughs> the, the the peak uh, of success of the building, its uh, of its functioning uh, and its condition, its physical condition, was uh, during its uh, ceremonial uh, opening. Uh, 
we can see the public seats very sitting very organizedly uh, between the uh, uh, between uh, between the the market stalls which are completely empty looking and uh, listening to the to the speech given by the mayor of Haifa complimenting the architects the architect standing just uh, next to him I'm sorry about uh, his imagination and genius that granted this futuristic city a building to be proud of. Unfortunately, this is the site, uh, this is the site today. Um, this picture taken only after its opening, probably a day or so after, afterwards, you can see, uh, you can see the market uh, with many stores that was not occupied yet and stores that are not in use. And uh, actually from the beginning, it was never fully occupied, never succeeded to be occupied by, uh, uh, by, by, uh, by stores. These two photographs from the mid forties shows us that the, the, the upper floors was uh, was actually changed, and instead of the of the stores that were supposed to be there, it was uh, used for for offices for different organizations. The market actually didn't succeed of going up uh, up to the upper levels as as intended. Going now back to the uh, to the plan of uh, to the plan of Gerstel. Uh, maybe we'll start with the, with the basic uh, the, with the basis of the of the of the plan. You can see a, a very simple grid uh, was composed by Gerstel, uh, just a matrix of uh, of uh, rectangulars of what five and five meters, eleven by five with a semicircular. Uh, semi semicircle uh, to the north of it, and above that the whole building and construction was done. I, I will uh, maybe explain only the main the main levels that they were, were built above. Uh, first, uh, the ground floor uh, that actually covered the entire grid. Um, I marked the darker the the commercial commercial areas, the shops. Uh, you can see. It 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 reminds me actually uh, somehow of uh, of a weekend market, a weekend Euro European market uh, in a, in a public square, uh, going uh, all the way to uh, to to Campo del Fiore, maybe a little bit far, but uh, the only difference actually is that the the architect himself. Planned, uh, planned uh, the facades, the city, fa the city facade, uh, artificially. Uh, if we go up, uh, up the levels, we can see the building is terraced. Uh, the first level is a little bit smaller, enabling two, two, two outside exterior terraces and uh, a central space inside. You can see again the dark, the dark areas. Uh, Indicating the commercial, the, the shops are, are arranged uh, along the along the uh, central space and uh, attached to the to, to the outer facade of the building. The same in the second level, a little bit smaller, but again uh, around the central space. The the upper level, the the third level, the roof level actually. Well, was uh, planned to be some kind of a restaurant. It should have been a very, very nice restaurant. Only it was never used. And going up the roof, you can see the the, the marvelous, the magnificent view overlooking Haifa and uh, the Haifa Bay and the north. If we look at the compilation of all these levels, uh, you can see the commercial shell darkened all around the central space. All uh, planned uh, with the simplicity, completeness, and uh, repetitivity, and uh, very characteristic, characteristic, characteristic of uh, of uh, Gerstel uh, work. Going uh, maybe inside to the central uh, to the central space, and again quote from his son from uh, 
Leopold Gerstel. He's saying the central hall in its present dimension is a public space that belongs to the entire residents of Haifa. And this, spa this space should be, should be pro uh, protected, I mean, to be conserved or preserved. Uh, I, I think that Leopold de Gerstel points here the importance of the central space as a public space, something like a piazza, a platz, uh, something of a, an open square, uh, an open, open square, uh, rather than a patio of a building. Looking at the, the shops, the commercial shell, what I called, he calls it, uh, Gerstel called this, calls this the, the horseshoe shaped wall of shops that creates a large formal central space existing regardless of the change of function of those shops. And if some of the shops uh, don't function, it is a minor problem for the spacing between which they define always function. Uh, I believe that uh, Leopold Gerstel uh, describes here the, the role of, of the shops, not as commercial, but uh, as an architectural one, uh, defining, defining the space inside, which is, is the important thing. Uh, maybe to express that, uh, I would like to show you a, a section, a cross section of a typical uh, shop and the passage in front of it, overlooking the, the path the central space. Uh, as we look, we can, we can see it, it functions as well as, uh, as uh, three layers that, uh, uh, that let uh, free ventilation and, and the natural light to come inside from the outside to the interior. If we go from left to right, we we'll see on the outside, the, the horizontal uh, windows we saw from the outside, is uh, a very typical uh, steel windows, carefully designed, uh, maybe even tailor-made by Gerstel himself uh, to this project, and systematically was placed in each window of, of the shops. Going to the center, we can see the, the opening of the shops uh, that was, uh, unlike this picture on the right with this uh, later added uh, wall, was designed to be completely open. And uh, the entire shop was open to the, the passage in front of it. Uh, even when closed, even when closed, it was closed only by a scroll grill, no doors and no walls in front of it. Here's uh, some uh, sketch of Gerstel himself of uh, the design of this scroll grill. Uh, making it seems that it was uh, an architectural choice rather than a security one. Again, looking at this shell of, uh, of this commercial shell, we can see that uh, uh, this, uh, this, this scroll grill is functioning actually like uh, something like a lattice walk. Yes, what we call a mashrabia that uh, goes all around this, uh, this central space and lightening it. If we're going out to the passage in front of the in, in front of the shop overlooking the central space, we can see the the careful uh, cho uh, choose uh, of material uh, by Gerstel, making the difference from the interior to the passage and the exterior to the central space to the patio. To the, to the interior, uh, the whole wall, the whole wall was covered by a very smooth mosaic. And uh, to the exterior, or to the patio, to the central hall, it was covered with um, a washed uh, plaster, with a granular washed plaster, what we call uh, it's a German washputz, um, making it seem like actually an exterior facade, though it's inside the building, the central space. Looking uh, to the central space from above, we can see uh, we can see again the the arrangement of the of the market stalls, very systematically and symmetrically. Unfortunately, most of it was ruined during the time. We can see its uh, footprint or marks on the concrete. 
is a typical market stall as photographed by the same photo photographer of uh, Gerstel, uh, showing its components were very well designed. Um, unfortunately, again, it was all ruined. I put here on the left, uh, maybe the inspiration, yes, the market, uh, the European uh, uh, market, uh, weekend market, uh, the same thing, only built and designed. Going back to this uh, scheme of uh, ventilation, uh, for, for of natural ventilation and, uh, and lightning, we can see it duplicates itself throughout the section of the building. It's actually a, uh, an holistic uh, solution for the for the entire building, making uh, the, the making the central space well ventilated and the lighting uh, by natural light and uh, and airflow. We got no need of uh, air conditioning. Surely during the 40s, but I, I must admit that uh, I, I should testify that even during the hottest days in summer. Uh, the, the warmth is not, uh, you can't feel it inside. Uh, Gerstel, uh, Leopold Gerstel, the son, is writing uh, about this framed space that never needs technical means to function. The essence of a verification of this axiom by reality is the greatness of this project. He refers, actually, he refers to the functioning of the shops or malfunctioning of the, the shops, uh, the fact that it was not, not functioned, not functioning. But uh, I'm using it here to uh, maybe to, to refer the, the, the ventilation and the lightning uh, of, of this, uh, of this uh, building uh, without, without any technical means, with no electricity and no air conditioning. To finish up, uh, maybe the, the, this uh, uh, this presentation of the building, we must uh, look at the ceiling, uh, uh, the roof of this uh, central space, uh, built with uh, very nicely, very nicely arranged uh, glass bricks. Uh, unfortunately, again, uh, it was it was all covered with uh, layers of bitumen in order to seal the roof. Uh, thus. Uh, and uh, blocking the, the sunlight, the, the natural sunlight to come in. Uh, so uh, very, very briefly, I was trying to, to show you uh, the cultural and architectural context, uh, context and contrast that, uh, is, is, uh, that you can see in this building. Regarding the continuity uh, in space and time, maybe I will leave it for the future. Uh, spoke uh, for Guy, yeah, he might uh, add up for it. Um, thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Amir. I think um, that was a wonderful presentation of a fascinating building, and I'm sure it gives a lot of our guests um, an image of what it takes to, to understand the building before talking about its role in the city today. I would like to take the chance before uh, going to our next speaker to to also thank our um, other uh, partners, or I should say leading partners, which is the municipality of Frankfurt, Stadt Frankfurt. And uh, we are uh, joined um, here by, um, by Philip and Marcus from there as well tonight. And also the municipality of uh, Tel Aviv. And uh, we are joined by Sharon Yaron Golan from the Liebling House, the White City Center there. And I will introduce, of course, our uh, uh, panel guests when we get to that part. So um, I think it's a great opportunity, the um, anniversary of uh, Tel Aviv and Frankfurt celebrating their 40th anniversary to, to get together and talk like this about um, architecture and about actually very complex problems that I'm really glad uh, we are raising here for looking at the past and now and future, um, and future issues. So um, we will now, um, 
um, here um, Andrea Jurges. And um, Andrea will talk about Frankfurt and other markets in Europe as well. Um, Andrea Jurges is the deputy director of the Deutsche Architecture Museum. And um, she uh, studied architecture at the Technical University Darmstadt and worked as an architect and journalist after her studies. Um, Today, she, uh, she will talk to us as an expert in uh, the possible futures of market halls, as she was part of the project team in charge of converting the former wholesale market hall in Frankfurt, which was originally built in the 1920s by Martin Elsasser and, and, um, and was um, um, and became part of the new headquarters for the European uh, Central Block, which is a project that, and Andrea will talk, of course, more about it by Coop Himmelblau. Um, so as I said earlier, Andrea will talk about Frankfurt, but then that's a starting point and she will move on to other cities in Europe. So uh, please, Andrea, welcome and thank you. First of all, thank you very much. I'm gonna start sharing my uh, presentation with you and as Inbal mentioned, uh, share, wait, um, as Inbal mentioned, I will start with the Frankfurt um, project, but move on to other market halls, um, looking what happens actually to market halls or what can happen. Um, we figured out there are three different ways to go about it those who become something else, those market halls which just remain market halls and other market halls, which have um, also other uses in them. So we start with the converted market halls because we start with the first project, which is the former wholesale market in Frankfurt, a building which is 250 meters long and 22 meters deep and 13 meters high, if I remember correctly and uh, was the wholesale market for fruits and vegetables since the 1920s. Um, it is part of the program of the Neues Frankfurt program started under Ernst May. And Martin Elsesser was the building, well, the city mun building director of the time under Ernst May. And he built a lot of the municipal buildings like the market hall, like um, a swimming pool and other buildings. And that is one of his I would say masterpieces. It, as you can see on the old, this is one of the old pictures where you can see the dimensions of the hall and that gives you an idea of what we're looking at. And it served, and uh, as um, Amir mentioned in the Haifa market hall, the same goes, there was no need for any ventilation because you could open windows and the big gates, which you see here, um, and it was close to the river mine, so really the, the cool air could flow in and the warm air out uh, from the upper windows. That is a picture just before the renovation by about 2002, and you see it is in need of repairs, similar to the current uh, situation at the market hall in Haifa, I would, I would think. And there were also other market halls, further uh, structures on the south of it. And you see the river mine was just beside it. It's in the east uh, of Frankfurt, and it was kind of at the edge of the city when it was built. And now it, it's become, of course, an integral part of the, of the um, city structure. Here you see once uh, on the, the black and white is a picture of how the market was organized or not organized at the very beginning. There were just simple stalls, not as nicely designed as the one in Haifa, I would say, but rather, yes, people brought in their fruits and vegetables and the wholesalers, um, so the shops and where you do later um, is, uh, was just on the on the ground. They came, just came in and got out. Later on, you see on the lower side is how it was how it looked in two thousand two. Uh, more installed stalls and more organized along the walkways and um, occupied and quite colorful, I have to say. That's a picture when it was empty. So in 2004, the wholesale market moved out to a new building in the north of Frankfurt, which was closer to the highways um, because most of the fruits and vegetables were then brought in by 
um, or, and are now being brought in by a uh, truck and not by train as it was in the 1920s. And you, you get an idea of how it looked before. You see the roof structure, they were um, really extraordinary concrete structures. They were roof shells with a, a very, very thin skin and they were really, they were tested. So they had to, in order to get the building permission in the 1920s, they had to uh, test build a small scale and really put the weight on that um, the municipalities could agree on having this built. It was partially destroyed during the war, uh, not this part, but on the other side and reconstructed not in the original way, which I will later explain why um, some changes were possible. The market hall was is under monument protection and it's a massive structure and it was clear and already in the 1980s that things need to change. The markets change how the uh, how it worked and um, it was okay to have it running but there was a need of change and of course uh, the entire district changed so the city of Frankfurt was looking for somebody who would um, what to do with it, what to do with this massive structure. They were thinking of uh, using it as a swimming pool, possibly in the Olympi uh, Olympics bit. And uh, I don't know if that would have been possible, but uh, that didn't come of anything. And in 1998, I think, uh, um, the, uh, the European Central Bank agreed to acquire the site and build its new permanent headquarters there. Until then, um, the European Central Bank was only in rented offices since 1994. And so the entire, no, 2001, they signed the contract. And then the entire project started with a huge competition, architectural competition in two phases. And um, it was really done at a time when a lot of other supernatural institutions held competitions like the International Criminal Court, for example, also stems from that time of, of uh, competition time. What you also see on this picture on the right hand side is some test fields of how to reconstruct actually um, the, the colors the market hall originally held. Because you see it's all gray, it has all been not really well maintained and here you see the testing in close cooperation with the uh, monument protection authorities of Frankfurt and of Hesse, how to really renovate these structures. And that was done extensively, just to get you again, the size of the market hall that was after the um, wholesalers moved out. And you see how the window, old windows looked similar actually from the structure as the Haifa market hall. So there's a lot of similarities I have to say of the time and they were really elegant, fine steel um, structures and really thin glass. And that was not, uh, that was translucent, but not totally transparent. That changed now. You see the first buildings, the new, these are new windows and they tested it. So they built test windows in a, uh, of course, not single pane anymore, uh, but at least uh, two panes, if not three panes, if I remember correctly, to really have the same look even though you have a totally, completely different use inside. And this is then the workers actually doing the work. So all the windows were exchanged, the concrete was thoroughly renovated, the brick, the, every joints between the bricks was renovated by hand, I think 77 kilometers just of the brick uh, facade to be renovated, the glass was exchanged, the entire uh, concrete, they looked at it, at the steel and the concrete, if it was good or not, and uh, reconcreted if necessary. Of course, that was part of this entire renovation project. So luckily by uh, the European Central Bank agreeing to this, um, buying the site and renovating this hall, that hall could be saved, even though it changed dramatically. This is a, blick, uh, a view onto the roof. We th I think we had 15 roof shells um, and they were all cleaned by hand, removed all the old bitumen by hand, re, um, th the same, uh, there was a special, it was called uh, Torkretisieren. That was a, a, a special concrete um, way how to pull, uh, how to put the concrete 
on the surface so that it stayed and that was done where necessary and really thoroughly renovated. It was, it's an unbelievable task. You just see the size of this is one worker in, at one shell and that was all done thoroughly to renovate it. And so I wish that, I'm, I'm really happy that this happened because it's an extraordinary structure and it's really not many that can see. And this is the change that occurred. Of course, wholesale market to become the new headquarters of a European institution, of a central bank, so of, a, of an office structure, which has um, lots of meetings because it's the European Central Bank with other national central banks. So there was some changes to occur. And of course, it needed kind of a new entrance. And that was one of the challenges also notable in the competition. Three of these 15 roof shells were destroyed during the Second World War, or even 15, actually, uh, five of the 15. And um, to get the new main entrance into the, um, let's say, let's mark the new main entrance, Korb Himmelblau designed um, a new structure called the Entrance Building, where the press conferences are held today. And um, that was inserted through the market hall and connecting then the main entrance to the new tower behind it. I'll get to that later. And for this, the, these three roof shells were removed. And that was possible because they were not constructed in the original way. So the monument protection authorities agreed that this can be removed in order to preserve the rest of the market hall. And there you see, there's a lot happening, of course, because inside the market hall, it's not an empty space anymore, but it houses all the main conference area of the, of the European Central Bank, together with some technical facilities, which you don't see. But so there's a lot more, um, it's not as empty as it was before, that was not possible, but there are uh, still elements you can see today. This is the new conference area. It's a house in house, it's a separate house inside the market hall. So you can still see the old structure and thoroughly renovated, I have to say. So this is really a remarkable change. Of course, it is a massive change because it's a completely different new use. And um, they, they also, also did, of course, different architecture wise. So they didn't do concrete, but they built this steel glass structure inside so that you really can see the differences. And this is then, the new, the main offices are in the office tower behind and you see the wonderfully renovated facade um, below. That's another picture. It had those wing buildings, which were also offices, which are today again offices and another um, meeting area and library. And there you see the tower, which was erected behind it. And on the lower level, on the lower hand side, on the right hand side, you see the finished building still without the gardening. So it's a lot greener now. But uh, you see the, the, this new entrance building, how it protrudes through the hall and really connects the, the office tower with the main entrance to the north, but um, is, is of a different architecture to really make it readable what is the market hall or was the market hall and what is the new structure. And to give you an insight, this is an old building of this because there's an old paternoster in um, in this, in the West Wing building, which was running continuously up and down because it was where the main offices were. And it was really a special structure with all this internal brick. When we acquired, when the ECB acquired the site, it looked like this, upper right hand side. It was this wonderfully light green plaster um, surface. And of course, what the ECB did, they renovated this entire space, how it originally looked. What you don't see, you see the dark sky. It was originally in the dark red uh, color. So that is what was found out together with the monument protection authorities, how it originally looked and was thoroughly renovated. There's a lot of work being done on this in all the details. So that was, I think it was the, worth the effort to do this. It was very courageous. Of the, uh, of the European Central Bank to actually say, yes, we're going to deal with this structure. There were lots of surprises, I have to say, because it wasn't, when it was built in the 1920s, it was an experimental building. They, they tried things out. So, of course, you looked before how it was done, but only by renovating every little 
millimeter of it, you discovered all the surprises. In some of the concrete structures, there was hardly any steel. It was like this structure had this, min this much steel in it. And you think, oh, wow, good, fine. And now how do we ensure that it keeps up for the next hundred years? Or that every concrete um, foundation was done slightly different. So you could not apply the, re, um, the, uh, the reinforcement of the foundation. You had to adjust it every time. And that took longer than, of course, uh, initially an, uh, anticipated, and nobody could know about that. Life is full of surprises with the, uh, when you get a building built, in the, especially in the 1920s. But I think it was worth every effort of this. And um, I think they did a good job to really renovate it, to reuse it, and um, becoming part of this new building, of this new function, is really a good alternative because I think the city of Frankfurt looked for about 15 years for some, for some idea how to reuse it. And I think only because the um, European Central Bank is also a public institution, it doesn't have to cramp all space. So you didn't have to build all floors in it, but, but you could um, build the separate structure so you can still see the, uh, also from the interior, the old structure. Now to, onto something else. Um, as said, the European, the, the change from the wholesale market in Frankfurt to the European Central Bank is, I think, the most dramatic change I found for any market hall. There have been changes, or more dramatic changes again. We had the Deichtorhallen in Hamburg, which is now a museum, which was before um, a market hall, or uh, there was a vegetable market, especially in front of it. So that changed to a museum. That is, of course, quite easy because from the inside you have plenty of space and they do wonderful exhibitions with a large scale or photographic um, modern art. We have found the Alle Sangerie in Brussels, Belgium, which still looks similar to what it was before, but is now a venue for events, readings, and there's also a club in the basement. Um, so there's no club in the, in the wholesale market hall in Frankfurt, but there's one in Belgium. And I think these are the most dramatic changes and just for a completely different one. This is not a market, but it was um, a wharf and that has been changed. So the structure is still here. And, but it has been changed now to an art, artist community with bars, restaurants. So there's a huge change in the structure. If you ask, what do you do with these massive structures? What do you do in the future? And there's not a lot um, which happens because mainly markets tend to remain markets because they, they are of course in a perfect location. They are in the center of the city. They, um, they have this open structure and I had to include of course Valencia because it's one of the most gorgeous markets I have ever met. Um, and of course what they also included is a bar where people meet in, in the market and they have a drink and they have food. So there's a slight switch that you not only buy um, raw food, but you can also enjoy processed food and drinks. The same goes for the Markthalle in Stuttgart, Germany, that is still the market hall that has also been built by uh, Martin Elsesser um, a little bit earlier. So it looks slightly different. Or we have the market hall in Royan in France, which was built in the 1950s, which is still a market. I think it's a remarkable building. I think next time I'm going to France, I shall have a stop over and have a look at it and how it really looks when you're inside. The uh, market hall in Budapest has a similar structure than a market hall in Frankfurt. And that is remarkable, of course. And uh, we have not found anything else beside this picture. And I'm not sure if it still exists or if it has been destroyed, but I think it's uh, interesting to see that the market hall in Frankfurt, because um, Budapest has been built afterwards, has inspired other structures similar. And of course, also built on a grid. So when we talk about Haifa, that was built on a very strict grid. The market hall, the wholesale market hall in Frankfurt was also, of course also built on this very, very strict grid, which helps organize a market. The one in Peru built in, I have no idea, built in 1940. Sorry, I couldn't see that here, there. 
So um, also a very modernist structure, a market still today, or the, um, the market in, in Mexico built in 1958, also one of those almost brutalist structures, if you look, uh, if you have a look at the picture outside, is still a market. And you see what they all have in common is this huge, massive space, open space, so that the warm air goes up and the cool air goes in and you have the cool air where you, where you want to have the fresh produce. The Kleinmarkthalle in Frankfurt is one of the most beloved gems in Frankfurt, to go back to Frankfurt, uh, built in 19, 1877, really? Oh, wow, no, it's from the 1950s, I think. Um, and uh, because there was once the idea to renovate this market, to do it differently, to uh, exchange this translucent facade, which you can see here in the picture and make it a clear facade and more open to the outside. And there was a massive protest to change it because people love their Kleinmarkthalle. So that's for the, uh, that's for the direct, for the, um, so for us citizens to go to a market and it's, um, it's very popular. It has been very popular before um, the pandemic set in. Also you could, and, and there's a bar on the outside where everybody on Saturday gathered for a drink after buying fresh produce. And so there's, you can see that on the lower picture, this is the market and they normally had a stall outside and um, you could enjoy a wine or two or several more with your friends. That is an interesting example. Aldepo, France. There had been a competition what to do with the old market hall um, and won by MVRD, uh, MVRDB, there's a B missing, unfortunately, sorry. And what happened is this. So this is how it looked before. Interesting structure, um, a bit derelict and need of renovation. And they did some renovation. The MVRDV design did not happen. And this is the outcome. So you see what can happen if maybe some changes in funding appears. And um, at least it doesn't look too bad. Could look worse. Um, I could imagine things worse than this one. And then, of course, we have those market halls which look at things a little bit differently, which mix basically the market with some other things. The uh, wholesale market in Hamburg is now not only a wholesale market, but also houses, uh, theater, and uh, other space, and exhibition space. So. Actually, the wholesale market before was not very accessible, just for um, normal, for shop um, owners. And now you can go there as a general public and enjoy also the market hall atmosphere. And I really like the building. You, when you come by train uh, to Hamburg, you actually uh, can see it from the train. Then, of course, we have the very famous Markthalle 9 in Berlin, Markthalle 9, uh, which was a market. Um, and then they saved it by um, Aldi and Lidl becoming part. So the supermarkets moved in, something we, uh, I'm, I saw in, uh, in Spain a lot. So they tried to um, get young people into the markets, into these old market hall structures, because young people don't go there, they go to a supermarket. And so what also in Spain happened a lot is that the general supermarket they move into the basement or in the front or on one side and they try, uh, try to draw the younger crowd and then you have still the market. The Mark Talanoin changed completely. It's now more or less a food market and um, a venue to be for lunch and dinner and uh, where you can, at different stalls, you can get uh, any cuisine you can think of from Italian to Asian food or German food and people enjoyed a lot, so that was saved by the Aldi supermarket chain. That's another image of the Mark Talle 9, how it looked until recently. Then we have the Mark Talle in Kassel, which is, has become now um, a flea market on different levels, as you can see on the lower image. 
We have the old Spitalfields market in London, which is now a flea market. Um, so the market is a market, but the kind of uh, things you can buy there or, and sell there changed. But the structure is actually quite open um, and they have some more fixed stalls and some more open stalls as in the previous picture and even more settled for the food court. So it's more a venue for, um, for, uh, for your free time instead of a necessity to go there to buy your food. The new old market hall in Basel is also changing in, so that it, it combines flea markets, street food, cooking classes, comedy, concerts, and a lot more. So there's a, a tendency to, instead of having a mono structure, a mono function, only one single function, to become a multi-functional space. Something which changed a lot uh, is here the Mar Mercado San Miguel in Madrid. This is the old picture, so more closed um, appearance for the markets. And now this has been completely transparent. Um, and you have all the food market in there as well. That's one remarkable change. One of the oldest um, Barcelona markets. And uh, it was restructured by uh, Enric Mirais in Benedetta Taliabua with this really colorful roof. And I think I've been there and it's actually great. And now it's become a popular space again with the transformation of the roof, with the transformation of the space, it has become attractive again. It was a market hall before, it's a market hall again, but it changed and it attracts now a lot more people because the appearance slightly changed. I don't know if that would be for you for the best, the perfect solution, but I think it's an interesting aspect. What if you slightly change things and the, and, uh, the use actually stays the same? And then of course, as the last image, as the last example, something completely else, the newly built market halls. So the tendency, yes, we built again a market hall. So somewhere you have market halls, buildings left over and don't know what to do with it. Others are in need of a market hall and they build it. And of course here, the multi-use is integrated in the building because you have the apartments on the outside. And on the inside, you have the market, which I think is interesting to see that the market never stops to be market. It's just a question of where is the appropriate place and what to sell and buy there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea, for this wonderful presentation. It's amazing the, the diversity that's within this um, typology. Um, so uh, what I suggest we do now uh, for this evening, we thought that since the Talpio market in Chaya has not yet been renovated. We invite two um, special guests who will briefly um, present uh, perspectives on what is going on now with the market and maybe what can uh, be done. And then they will be joined by our other panelists. So uh, I would like to introduce, uh, I suggest that um, Guy will say a few words first and then Regen. So I would like to introduce Guy Shachal. He is the Director of Projects and um, build, Buildings and Sites in the, in, for the Haifa Conservation uh, Department in the municipality. And um, he's an architect. He's also studied at the Technion Institute of Technology in Israel. He's also in his training a geographer and an engineer and writes uh, a blog titled Multidisciplinary, A Multidisciplinary View of the World. And uh, Regev Natanzon, who um, will speak uh, after Guy, is a lecturer in the Department of Communications at Sapir Academic College. Um, where he heads the digital media program and serves as co-director of the Smart City Innovation Lab. Regev, uh, 
received his PhD um, from um, the University of Michigan and his work in the city of Haifa and specifically in the neighborhood where the Talpiot market is focused on representing the uh, coexistence, so-called coexistence between um, Jews and um, Arabs there. Um, so I invite you each um, to, to present your perspectives and then uh, uh, please, if you will kindly join us, uh, Philip, um, Philip Storm from the Ernst May uh, Foundation and Markus uh, Gvishenberger from uh, the Frankfurt Municipality along with uh, Eran and Sharon uh, Golan. So uh, please, Guy, we can begin with you, I think. Thank you, Inval and Amir and Andrea for the wonderful uh, presentations. First of all, I must comment that uh, I was so fascinated by the Gross Nachthal in uh, Frankfurt, especially admiring the, the, the huge and, and, and fascinating space. And then when I saw the, the renovated version and the addition or a kind of uh, infill inside, I was kind of uh, asked myself a, a question, whether it's, uh, you know, the the, the uh, the, the, the correct intervention in such a unique, unique, unique space. So this is a question that maybe we will um, be able to discuss later uh, if we have some time, but I could not, uh, uh, I saw me this, lots of similarities between the modernist approach of those uh, two buildings. And, and I must say that uh, at least the approach here in Haifa for the renovation of, of the Antioch market building, uh, the idea is to renovate it and keep it as much as uh, possible as the original uh, form, of course. Um, and in, in that sense, in the sense of the, of the size of the building, I think it, it is more similar to, to the Kleine market in, in, in Frankfurt. But there's a difference, and I will uh, refer to it uh, in a minute. I want to just show some, some slides uh, that will help us uh, uh, get the, the context. So uh, do you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Um, yeah, we can. Let's go. Right, so I, I just want to uh, give some perspective about the area, uh, which is important to, to answer some questions about our approach, especially for the uh, program or the use uh, of the renovated uh, building. So I'll address that, uh, continuing Amir's presentation, the continuity aspect uh, in a time manner and then in a space manner. So referring to the time issue, uh, the, the, the market has been a sleeping beauty for most of the time until about 10 years ago. And in this era, local activists and academic entities uh, used to do all kinds of activities in the, in the, in the building. It was still uh, serving as a market, but only partially, only the underground floor served as a, an active uh, marketplace with stores and everything. And the other um, floors were, were actually abandoned. So activists uh, such as uh, Yael Sivan, I know if he's attending the meeting, uh, uh, organized, um, these were actually local, uh, local groups from Hadar neighborhood that were initiating all kinds of uh, activities to raise awareness about uh, uh, the need to renovate the building. So these were examples of, uh, this, this is an example of Friday uh, breakfast that were done in the market People were buying groceries at the market and then going to the abandoned uh, ground floor and doing those meetings. It was, of course, a social meeting as well as a nice gathering uh, using materials from the market. Uh, then there was a very interesting course that I participated uh, when I was a student at Technion with students participating, doing artistic works in the market to raise, again, awareness about the project, uh, about the market. Uh, as you can see on the left side, the two students were uh, were playing as if they are getting married, and they came to to, to do some photo ops before they made their, their wedding. And many people thought it's, it's true, and it was, it was very very interesting. Um, then uh, another project that I initiated in Haifa, the Haifa Trail. This is, by the way, the, the German article about it. Uh, I put the market on the map to, to include it in this uh, project, which is actually a, a curation of the best sites in Haifa. So the idea is again to, to put it on the map to put uh, to show the importance of the of the market. Then the awakening beauty started about five years ago. Local businesses, people started to, to see the potential and opened uh, mainly uh, food places, but not in the building itself because the building was still you know uh, in a in a rickety condition. So all the streets uh, surrounding the 
the market where other uh, uh, shops of the market were already existing for many years. Uh, this area started to develop. Um, this is an, an article in, in Ynet, a very known uh, Israeli uh, uh, news website, uh, you know, covering the, the, the food, the, the food for foodies or food opportunities uh, around Tel Aviv market. And this is similar to, to what we see in several other market areas in Israel, uh, both in Tel Aviv, uh, uh, Carmel market, and in Jerusalem's Machne Yehuda market. But the market area turned into a, 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 a you know an enjoyment uh, area with lots of restaurants and food places uh, among among the, the the stores and the shops. So this in a way started to happen here as well, but again outside the main building. And I must say, of course, that that uh, uh, in contrast to to Europe, where where winters are generally cold and uh, you know it's, it's windy and sometimes snowy. And it's inviting to to uh, to enjoy an in, indoor market in Israel. It, part of it, of course, is, is is cultural, but also the weather is more suitable to do things uh, outside. And then, what I call the abused beauty, around two years ago, people started to see the potential. What we call the investors from Tel Aviv coming to Haifa, buying properties, and prices start uh, to go up. Of course, it's only. Uh, uh, like on the paper, because the area is still uh, very poor and needs uh, renovation. Um, so this uh, does not reflect really the, what the, the area look and feel is yet. Then a few words about this, the, the continu continuity uh, of the space aspect. As I told you uh, just before, you can see here Silicon Street, the street of the, uh, where the market building uh, exists. Most of the shops, most of the stalls, it's actually stores, are outside the building, and uh, people do their shopping uh, in, in the uh, streets around it. This is practically how it looks today. And part of the renovation process uh, that the municipality plans not only uh, takes care of the building itself, but all the surrounding area in terms of uh, uh, putting new, um, um, what do you call it, the um, in Hebrew, the, the, like uh, those uh, shelves that. that uh, protect from rain and uh, rain and sun and uh, all kinds of other innovations on, on streets and um, putting sh and, uh, benches and other stuff. Um, another thing that uh, Amir mentioned before is that the market is on the edge. It's on the edge of Hadar neighborhood, as you can see here. And uh, this, this raises a question, um, in, will it be, um, you know, will it be an initiator for Hadar's revival or Hadar as a whole needs to be revived for this place to thrive. So this is a question uh, which is interesting, um, and again, for discussion. Then another view, uh, going uh, a bit closer, uh, there's the marketplace here in, in this uh, yellow uh, uh, circle. And that is Wadi Salim, which is quite an empty area. It was a, a thriving, uh, beautiful Arab neighborhood, but it was uh, destroyed uh, during the years. And uh, so it's, it, it's in emptiness, an empty place. And there's a beautiful flea market just on the downtown, but this area, these areas hardly connect because there's a big barrier here. There's a road that was built here and there's a, a topographical gap, um, which does not allow easily to, to, to create a, a holistic experience or holistic, uh, uh, I would say urban fabric that these all places can you know, work together as a, as a markets area. So this is another uh, question, how to fill and bridge gaps uh, here in Haifa, which are generally uh, topographical and, and urban. And another uh, issue, of course, it's always in the background in Haifa. Haifa is surrounded still by industrial uh, elements, uh, you know, the oil industry, a uh, legacy from the, the British mandate and the, the old port and the new port, which is being built now, and the Navy base. So this is a kind of a question, um, how th this reflects or uh, sorry affects Haifa as a whole, and in specific and specifically uh, renewal of the older uh, parts of uh, Haifa. So this is something to to to, to remember in, uh, in the background. And I want to uh, raise a few questions that maybe we can discuss later. First of all, is uh, how much and where do authorities need to invest in public infrastructure? In order to create the positive effect, or what are the limits of the of the intervention in public space that is needed um, to do the, the needed effect in the market and surround and, and the surrounding area, which is now very poor. 
Another question is, um, of course, there are lots of initiatives we see now following the plans for what we call real estate renewal, you know, building new buildings or adding floors to buildings, adding only apartments, which can, of course, lead to kind of gentrification. Will it save the place uh, or not? Or is this the, the good direction that we want to see? And of course, the role of tourism as, an, as a catalyzator or non-tourism in the immediate time due to COVID-19. These are a few thoughts to, to think about in the discussion. Thanks. And of course, one last thing to remember is there's a grungy atmosphere to this place today, uh, which is kind of you know, one of the magnets to this area. And this happens in many places that are you know, you know, only starting to, to be developed. And, and, and the grunge atmosphere uh, is an attracting thing, but once everything starts to be renovated and uh, you know, it becomes a bit luxurious, it loses this special sense of the place. And the idea is how to keep it on the right amount in order to still keep the, the, you know, the character, the special character of the place, this is also something that we should uh, all think about. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Guy. So uh, Regev, uh, would you like to, to comment on this whole very complex relationship between the building and the neighborhood and the atmosphere and, and what the present and the future look like? Yeah, first of all, thank you, Inbal, for inviting me for this panel. And uh, the previous speakers were really fascinating in their uh, perspective. And I don't know exactly where to begin because I have a lot to say and I would want to be very short. Uh, so maybe I'll begin uh, Guy and Dad. And I just referred to something that Andrea mentioned, that life is full of surprises. And... That's a great invitation for anthropologists to dive in. Um, I think that what we see today, it's nothing new in how nothing new in many urban spaces, is already a process of gentrification. It's nothing uh, imagined. It's uh, not a thing that is, it's not a possibility. It's happening on the ground. And it's happening together with what we might call uh, urban colonization. Um, the bringing in uh, of uh, particular social uh, groups into specific neighborhoods in order to them to a particular, uh, in, in a particular way. But I'll, I want to go back and throw a question here for the panelists and ask you, uh, you know the question by Lefebvre, who has the right to the city? And I want to ask you, who has the right to a market? When you uh, design a market, how do you go about doing that? Who do you talk with? Uh, who, what few uh, potential buyers do you imagine? How do you imagine uh, their... Uh, practices within the market, outside of the market? Uh, how do you read time and space? Same questions that Guy opened with. Uh, and I'm asking it because what I know of uh, Talpiot market is that whenever they talked about how to save it from years of underdevelopment, from years of neglect, uh, whenever a new plan was designed, no one, no one talked with the people who live around the market. And a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I was a part of a group of uh, uh, people with all kinds of expertise in Hadar neighborhood who tried to think about uh, the fate of not the market, but the surroundings of the market. market. We tried to see who actually lives there. And to follow on what Amir presented at the beginning, the story of Hadar, indeed the market was um, established as a result of the Arab uh, revolt. The Arab revolt should uh, remind ourselves is a result of Zionist colonization in the area. Uh, but the neighborhood of Hadar was never Jewish only. It was always 
a mixed neighborhood, particularly in the spring of the Talpiot market. And particularly now, it is a place where people from the lowest classes live, both uh, Palestinians and Mizrahi Jews and labor migrants and people who live in social housing. Those are, are the people who live there. Those are the people who are already being evicted because as Guy mentioned, real estate value is going regardless of things or facts on the ground. Nothing is changing on the ground, but real estate value is going up because of various plans that are being imagined and published and discussed in these kinds of forums. And a couple of years ago, when uh, my friends and I tried to think about how we can serve as experts, uh, anthropologists, urban designers, sociologists, uh, social workers, and so on, uh, we talked with the residents, we organized meetings 10 minutes walk from the market, as another meeting in Hadar neighborhood, and we submitted a paper for the municipality and tried to recommend the municipality to hold, to put moratorium on every plan it has to the area before they take care of those who already live there, before they make sure they have the budget to support people, residents of the neighborhood who will the future, who will enjoy whatever they'll be from the Talpiot market. Those are the people who should enjoy it. Now, I go back to the question of who has the right to the market because those who, those who live there now are not regional residents of the neighborhood. Some of them moved in the neighborhood 10 years ago. Some of them moved in the neighborhood 20 years ago. Some of the people who lived there in the area do not live there because, because of the war of 1948 came refugees, they live in Liberia, in Europe, in Canada. Do they have the right to say what they think the Talpiot market should, like, should look like? And how the municipality could, the municipality actually plan something that looks at the surrounding of a particular building. How the municipality could actually imagine Kinds of what kinds of activities, economic activities, residential activities, activities on the ground, and I think to, to go back to Guy's question, public institutions invest if they neglected, if they divested, if they created underdevelopment. Of course, it's their responsibility to invest and to make sure that private money, even if it's for social causes, will not be invested before the municipality, before any social uh, organization, public organization, may they do what they should do, take care of public interest. Public interest should look, first of all, to those who have no one else to protect them, the residents of the lower classes, uh, of low, uh, classes of uh, ethnic groups that are being uh, discriminated against. And those are the people who live around the market. I will, I will close my comments here because I think I said enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's um, a really important perspective and, uh, and, and very the most probably the most basic uh, questions that should be asked by by architects and, and planners. Um, before we take um, questions from the audience, would any of our other pa uh, panelists like to um, um, to also um, say something and uh, and and suggest things in light of everything that we've talked about here in the past hour. Uh, let, let me reflect a little bit, because I think, uh, of course, what to do with the Talbiot market is not an, an easy thing to answer, as you can see, because it's been in the process for the last decade or even more. And I think uh, the question, who has the right to market, is, a, of course, a very valid and very good question. And it's not easy to answer. I mean, um, look at the changes 
of some of the market halls and there were not many changes. And I was thinking maybe the flea market could move just into the Talpiot market and that would be an appropriate use of the building if one can bridge the gap and really revive a little bit without too much changing the entire structure of the district. Of course, where, where the ECB is now, so the European Central Bank is now, yes, there has been gentrification. There has been a lot of changes in the entire district. It was an industrial district, the wholesale market, uh, lots of, of things, and it changed a lot from um, industrial buildings to there's now the longest uh, car sailor strip in Frankfurt or maybe even Germany, I don't know. And um, so what, what has been blue collar workers area has become an office area, um, advertising, advertising agencies moved there. And that was of course, but it was clear that the industry was moving out in the 1980s. And the city of Frankfurt did a lot to make a transition possible. And so that it was not a derelict district, but rather it was a changing district. And I think that was a very, a difficult topic in all its uh, meets and ends. Yes, and the, the rents increased, the wholesale market moved out and there were new apartment buildings being built right beside it with a very close to the river. Of course, they were of a different, a uh, lot of different people moved in compared to those who, who lived in the district for a long time and it's still changing. And I think um, there was also this topic of gentr gentrification, which was intensely discussed for the entire district. And it's just changing because it's one of the, the, the district is so close to the city center that people who were living there for a long time when it was just an indus industrial uh, working place um, moved out because they couldn't afford the rent anymore because um, house owners renovated their buildings and uh, made the rents then more expensive. And it's not over. This discussion is not over even in that district nor in any other district at Frankfurt. And we, I think in this says, sense, again, we face the same question and there's not an easy answer. And the only answer we have is who owns the buildings and who then can rent out the buildings is one of the most interesting, uh, more, the hardest questions to build, to, to answer. And maybe, okay, what, what if the market is not a market, but what, what else can happen in the Talpiot market? Can all those little stalls become artistic uh, studios? Can they become, um, and then the ground floor can become the flea market. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm sure you have discussed all of this at length, but I think uh, doing the research on what happens to market halls, I think it's very interesting to see that may, mostly they stay market halls for different produce and different products, but they stay the same. And then they just add more functions nowadays with bars and with uh, clubs and, and all this to revive the, and that of course reflects again on the entire district. So it's, it's you, you, I think you need both. You need to think about the building and you need to think about the district and who people who live there and what happens all around it. I mean, if you have this, I think breaking this barrier, this brown line, which you showed, you know, which uh, where, where things have to, how do you cross from the flea market then to the market and to the, to the district? I think these, these are the most important things to answer. Or maybe, Marcos, you want to add something on this? I mean, you're from the urban development department. Um, yes, I think it's very important to save or to protect the public accessibility um, of the markets. So to, to protect the, the, the uses, the public uses of the markets. And um, in Frankfurt for us, it's also very important, for example, to uh, protect the landmark Halle in the city center um, as, a, as a, um, yeah, a meeting point also for the neighborhood and for the citizens of Frankfurt. And I think it's very um, difficult question how to um, find new uses for um, a market hall like in, in Haifa and also like in other cities um, Andrea talked about. So this, I think the main question is who is the owner of the market hall? And um, is the municipality um, um, in, in, a, in a situation to protect the public use of, um, of this um, building? So I think this is the main point um, to, to save such buildings.
Thank you. I think, yeah, these are very, um, very important points. Um, is the market, the market in Talpiot uh, belongs to the city, right? They have the... Right. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. Must, I must comment that the, the municipality's approach to the, regarding the usage of the building is to, to create a, 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 a flexible approach. So the idea now is to renovate the building and prepare it or create an infrastructure for various usages. And I think that is a very clever approach because as the, as the neighborhood may, may evolve and, 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 and develop, the, the building can adapt itself to the various usage, usages. And there are many ideas coming up and um, I think it will evolve as, as, as the whole area evolves together with the building. Mm -hmm. Andrea, do we have uh, questions from, no, okay, great. Um, so, um, yes, Iran. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I wanted to add uh, um, uh, and to remember what uh, Amir was saying about the public, uh, about the public space and the public um, function uh, that maybe Gerstel was uh, envisioning. Uh, he, he envisioned it as a public space, as a marketplace, but uh, the past, um, I think, uh, 60, 70, almost 80 years proved that um, merchandise and, 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 and food hall, uh, stalls, uh, etc., or, or it's too small, or it's uh, uh, commercial uh, activity of a market on, on three levels uh, doesn't work. So uh, the, the building, uh, as, as beautiful as it is, and, um, and I think Amir had uh, uh, expressed it and uh, explained it very well. It's a, it's a modern building, and, but a very classical building, uh, technically uh, uh, very advanced for the time. Uh, and also a building which was built ex actually as a shelter uh, and also as a public space, so it has a lot of contradictions. All those qualities uh, uh, does not yet give it a, 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 the, the, the solution what to do with that today. Mm -hmm. it, it's too small to be a real uh, a huge space uh, like like the, the, the big uh, uh, retail market we, we've seen in the uh, in Frankfurt or like the, the Spanish uh, big covered markets, the, the scale is different. And, and I think indeed uh, uh, the Talpiot uh, uh, pose a, a very uh, challenging uh, question for uh, how to reuse it. Uh, but what we, we wanted to do with the, this kind of discussion today was to uh, bring to the attention and to bring forward, to internationalize a little bit the discussion of how to conserve it and how to keep its uh, uh, historical uh, and architectural qualities while thinking, yes, how to reuse it. And maybe now it's a time to stabilize it and then take a pause and think maybe during a competition, something that is in Israel is not very common. And uh, maybe the Haifa municipality should rethink to do a competition which will bring up um, uh, fresh ideas. Now when the, the documentation uh, file or documentation document, which Amir has made is complete and has a, gives a, a good clue, what are the values of the building? Now it's the time to, to rethink and pause it for a moment, uh, stabilize it and uh, and, uh, and uh, together, together, like uh, uh, Regev mentioned, uh, have a, a full communication with the with the, with the local neighborhood, uh, with the people who live around there. The, the users of the market are not always from the neighborhood, but uh, uh, the people who live there stay with the market also in the evening, uh, also in, in the morning. So, I think uh, this kind of uh, of a building. Uh, should have been for Haifa, a kind of a, a, light, a, a light tower, 
a locomotive of, uh, of, uh, of development of this side. And uh, also for Haifa, who has a huge uh, modernist heritage, this building could, uh, and the renovation of it, the conservation of it in the most meticulous way would have been the, the sort of uh, exemplary uh, uh, act process that uh, should have taken other heritage of the city forward. And uh, for us, uh, at least in Ecomos, uh, we, are, uh, we are concerned with the process and uh, would like to, to, uh, to support the, uh, the Haifa municipality and, and the process in, uh, in trying to balance those, uh, th those um, the need to, to develop it and to answer the, the, the immediate questions on the one hand and on the other hand to, to, to do uh, the best conservation project, which, which means also a project which is functioning, working and being reused in the best way. Um, I think that, that's the purpose of this discussion a bit. Yes, and the... uh, I have I have two questions on this. Um, first of all, what I think is important, especially talking about how perfectly it was built to for the market purposes, for the ventilation to work without any mechanical um, and other ventilation necessary. How much change would you allow to have other functions inserted, which would require a more closed areas, let's say in the upper stories, that of course changes the microclimate in this building. Um, for example, if you just say, instead of these, um, like, like it was built with these closed walls, I mean, that changes a lot. And what do you do if you build a glass wall out of it? So it's maybe artistic studios. I, I know everybody inserts, first of all, artistic studios, but anyway, just as an idea. And how much change would you allow in the building structure to still have the characteristics. I mean, that was the question for the wholesale market hall in Frankfurt, and there were intense discussions. And I agree with, with with Guy that you have different opinions. You know, it's not the perfect solutions, but the perfect solutions under the conditions possible to still have lots of the building be left over or to be really renovated and to st still stand there is a massive success compared to the option there was no option anymore. Um, and um, and this is this is and I think in this uh, the Talpian market is a lot easier um, to to uh, put it to slightly different uses to think about how to restructure it slightly because it's a smaller structure. This it's not this massive hall, empty vast hall, and you think, oh, what what am I supposed to do with this? Um, it's it's a lot easier because it has already on the upper stories the smaller stalls which are kind of separate units which give it a different structure so i see there's a greater flexibility to adapt it to new functions and the other question i have is how experienced i mean we here in germany i think are more and more in the process of doing competitions um, development the competitions marcus you are in the process of at least two of them um, to involve citizens more directly to have workshops with them of what is the need and their response to it. How is it in, in Haifa? Can that be thought of? If you think of a competition, which is generally a good idea, but how do you integrate it with the people who live there? Mm -hmm. I'd, like to, I'd like to read um, two comments from our, um, from our audience. Uh, one is from Daphna Levine, who lives nearby. She writes, I live on the Stair Street. That's a very, very uh, diagonal, narrow street uh, near the market, uh, just below it. Following Gregev's remarks about life in the mixed neighborhood of Talpiot Market, I would like to share with you a documentary story I wrote during the closure days a few months ago. The story has been translated into English, so I can send it to anyone who is interested. And uh, there is a link, so thank you, Daphna. And uh, Jörg Haspel uh, writes about some of um, our experiences when we were there last year in a previous workshop that we had. 
um, Jörg writes that when we were there last year, um, the German um, guests were fascinated first by the great architecture and the scale and character of these, this unique landmark, and second by the urban context of shops, dealers, restaurants, street lives, etc. And the quarter didn't look like it's abandoned or threatened by vacancy. This double character could be stabilized and strengthened and um, that's a fantastic vision for the building, for the residents, for Hadar and Haifa. And that was the, the impress, impression of our, again, our German guest last year when we, when we had a workshop uh, in Israel. So thank you for, for, these, uh, for these comments. <laughs> Something is working here. I think we've done, I'm done with Siri interrupting. Okay, so. Um, Andrea, I think uh, for the question, how many interventions uh, we'd, we would allow, first of all, I'm, I'm, we're not in a position to allow not, this is a municipality who has mm -hmm. to, to decide it. They have all the tools now to, to say it. I think Amir could, could uh, if you read the document Amir did, he talks about the, the the, the facades as expressing the value, the historical value also of the building being sort of a, a, a shelter because it was built in a, a, to be protected from, sh from shooting from downtown. So th this is difficult to, to, um, to undermine this value of closed walls uh, while the ventilation, etc., works with this idea. So, and, and uh, I think uh, in other presentations, we have seen there were so many ideas for this building uh, to to do a hotel out of it, to do a shopping closed shopping uh, mall out of it, uh, uh, air conditioned shopping mall. Uh, so many ideas. It was bought by companies. It was uh, sold back to the municipality. I, I I can't follow exactly the the details, but uh, many many efforts were done there, and and the building. Uh, was uh, witnessing all those efforts and, and uh, decaying uh, slowly and faster, actually. So uh, to the sense of, of values, I think that the, the value of the, of the outer shell is, is super important to, to keep the, the image of the building and, and uh, the, the climatic and, and the historical uh, elements which, which consist of it. I think the interior, the, the public, big, uh, the public kind of uh, what Amir doesn't call it a patio, but um, a common space. That's also a super important uh, feature. I think the, 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 the rest can be discussed very much. You have lower floors there, you have parking, you have uh, now a renovated floor, which is being used for the, for the, for the food stalls. Um, and there, the, the flexibility is bigger, but again, um, I think what happened in, uh, in uh, the market hall in, in Frankfurt, the, the big uh, retailer, it, this is not uh, the case here. Um, uh, we, we have so few of those uh, uh, high quality uh, building. I, uh, I don't think we, we could afford to have uh, such a radical change, but still, I don't, uh, I don't overrule a, a competition uh, which will prove differently. I'm, 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 let me just say, I think this, um, the reuse or conversion of the market hall, the wholesale market hall in Frankfurt is very unusual. It is, I think, uh, be, because due to the massive structure that uh, every other plan uh, also never developed, um, it could have been worse, of course. I still think what was in the end um, decided to build is a good solution. There was one question by Carol Parkos, uh, how much did the city of Frankfurt have to compromise on public accessibility of the Grossmarkthalle? At the moment, public visits are very limited, possibly only by the Martin Elsesser Foundation or the Jewish Museum, only a small part, and that is true. There was also, um, it was always I said, okay, the visitor center of the European Central Bank is located in the Grossmarkthalle. That is basically a very good idea. 
um, and uh, one could visit the visitor center. But due to all these um, security threats the European Central Bank faces, it, it's not free for all. Um, you could just walk in there and say, okay, I want to go in the visitor center, but rather you have to um, ask for um, an appointment and a visit there, unfortunately. And I was always, when I was at the ECB, I was always fighting for, okay, let's have it as public as possible. I mean, I, in an ideal world, um, the park would be accessible to the public, the surrounding of the market hall, the, the visitor center would just be accessible to the public. So you could learn more about the ECB and the market hall. So you could experience the space of the market hall. It was designed for that. And just because the situation changed and in every central bank is more under threat than before, um, that has not been really implemented. So this is, I think it is very exceptional due to the size and due to the now the uh, use of the European Central Bank. And I think what Marcus said to have it accessible to the public, I think it's a very important point for any of the market holds to thrive again, even if they have uh, struggles in between. Well, I think it, um, it's very true and um, relates also to Jörg's uh, last comment here that this is really a question of uh, not only of conservation and heritage, but also of, um, of an urban approach where we are then answerable not only to uh, conservation and, um, and um, and companies and owners, but also to the to the district, like you said, and um, and the residents of the of the neighborhood. Well, it's um, a little bit past uh, nine thirty. I, I have one more comment, of course. Uh, from in the Kenya, Gabriela Horn says, "I hope you allow not too many interventions. Go mm -hmm. downtown and see what was done to Aifa. Think about public transport in the Carmel and the areas there." I understand Regev and Aaron quite well. The topo topography, you can't compare to Frankfurt. That's well, true. That's one yeah. comment. Yeah. That was last week got on our end. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, I think these were all the, the comments, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, our next event is on uh, January 14, after the new year. So we very, very much would like to, to see you um, with us again in the next uh, lectures and panel. Thank you very, very much to um, Andrea and Amir and Regev and Guy and to our panelists. And uh, of course, to the city of Frankfurt, uh, the city of Haifa and Tel Aviv and Ikomos and Okomomo. I, I, I found it a very, very um, insightful discussion and, and learned a lot. I hope you all did too. So again, we hope to see you in about a month on the 14th of January and have a very good evening. I hope so too. Thank you very much. And I'll try to have a different background next time again. Bye-bye. <laughs> so, good evening. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.